Good evening. This right here is Mr. John Durham. He is, of course, the special counsel who was assigned to investigate the alleged spying that was done against President Trump's campaign back in the year 2016. And after remaining relatively quiet for the better part of the last two years, well, John Durham's investigation appears to be ramping up big time with two major developments having taken place over the span of the last week. Let's go through them together. However, before we actually jump into what the most recent filing says, I'd like to quickly introduce the three main actors so we'll be all on the same page. So the first is, of course, Mr. John Durham, who is the special counsel. Then you have Mr. Michael Sussman, who is a former Clinton campaign lawyer. He used to work for a firm called Perkins Coie, where he represented Hillary Clinton as well as the DNC during the 2016 election cycle. And he is currently facing trial for allegedly lying to the FBI. And then lastly, you have Mr. Rodney Joffe, who is a tech entrepreneur. He holds multiple tech-related patents, and he was a senior vice president at New Star Inc., which is a Virginia-based tech company which provides various internet-related services to both commercial as well as to government clients around the world. Okay, now that the introductions are out of the way, the first major development in the John Durham investigation came as a result of this court filing right here, which was submitted by John Durham's legal team. And within the pages of this court filing, it includes a text message exchange between Michael Sussman, who is again the former Clinton campaign lawyer, and Mr. Jim Baker, who served as general counsel for the FBI. And these text messages, they provide potentially conclusive evidence that Michael Sussman did in fact lie to the FBI. And then furthermore, it looks like he lied to them in writing. Here's specifically what this text message exchange said, quote, Jim, it's Michael Sussman. I have something time sensitive and sensitive I need to discuss. Do you have availability for a short meeting tomorrow? I'm coming on my own, not on behalf of a client or company. Want to help the bureau. Thanks. And then James Baker responded, okay, I will find a time. What might work for you? To which Sussman replied, any time but lunchtime. You name it. And so you might be asking yourself, why is this text thread so important? And the answer is frankly rather simple. These text messages, they show that Michael Sussman claimed that he was coming on his own, not on behalf of any client or company, even though, according to the prosecution, he was actually being directed to deliver this information by Rodney Joffe, the tech executive, and he was actually billing the Clinton campaign for his work. This lawyer was billing the Clinton campaign for this work. And the second reason that these text messages are so important is because previously, meaning several months ago, Mr. Sussman's lawyer, he denied that Mr. Sussman had made these claims to the FBI. Here was, in fact, the official statement from Mr. Sussman's lawyer prior to this text message revelation. Quote, the special counsel, meaning John Durham, has brought a false statement charge on the basis of a purported oral statement made over five years ago for which there is only a single witness, Mr. Baker, for which there is no recording and for which there are no contemporaneous notes by anyone who was actually in the meeting. And so you see, the lawyers who were representing Michael Sussman, they were making the defense that, for one, John Durham was lying, secondly, that there were no written communications, and that thirdly, everything was exchanged orally with no other witnesses. However, as these text messages clearly provide a different picture, as within them, Mr. Michael Sussman is rather unambiguously stating that he wanted a meeting with the FBI and that he was representing only himself and not any client or company. And the reason that this small fact is so important, well, actually, here's how John Durham himself explains the importance of these text messages. Quote, Sussman's allegedly false statement to Baker was, in fact, plainly material because it misled the FBI general counsel about, among other things, the critical fact that the defendant was disseminating highly explosive allegations about a then presidential candidate on behalf of two specific clients, one of which was the opposing presidential campaign. And so that was the first development worth mentioning. However, the second development is the real bombshell because according to another set of court filings submitted by John Durham's team just three days ago, it turns out that the data which were submitted by Michael Sussman was actually user created. Created. And so to start with, let me really set the stage for you. Several months after the meeting with the FBI, Mr. Michael Sussman began to pursue another meeting, this time with the CIA. And we know this because John Durham's latest filing, it includes a plethora of declassified CIA notes. And the first relevant note, it comes from January 31st of 2017, and that was when Mr. Michael Sussman first reached out to an employee within the CIA and discussed the possibility of setting up a meeting. Here's what that particular note says, quote, Sussman said that he represents a client who does not want to be known, but who had some interesting information about the presence and activity of a unique Russian-made phone around President Trump. The activity started in April 2016 when the president-elect Trump was working out of the Trump Tower on its Wi-Fi network and after his move to the White House. 
Now, this contact obviously proved rather successful because about a week later, on February the 9th, Michael Sussman did actually have a meeting with the CIA. And in that meeting, he provided the CIA with both documents as well as thumb drives that he claimed contained data on them related to potential Russian activities linked with Donald Trump. Here's specifically what a declassified memo said regarding this meeting with the CIA. Quote, Mr. Sussman gave a general description of the data he was providing on a thumb drive, noting that it was related to domain name system DNS information. His contacts had gathered information indicating that a Russian-made Yoda phone had been seen by them connecting to Wi-Fi from the Trump Tower in New York, as well as from a location in Michigan at the same time that then-candidate Trump was believed to be at these locations. In December of 2016, the Yoda phone was seen connecting to Wi-Fi from the executive office of the president, the White House. Now, let's set aside for a quick moment the scandalous nature of this whole affair, meaning how a lawyer who is actually representing the DNC can take such information directly to the CIA. And so disregarding that, the CIA actually reviewed this Trump Alpha Bank data in early 2017. And their findings are extremely significant because after analyzing the documents for themselves, meaning the, all the documents and the thumb drives that they were handed, well, they concluded that the data was not technically plausible and actually user generated. Here's specifically what the declassified documents within these court filings say, quote, Agency 2, meaning the CIA, concluded in early 2017 that the Russian Bank 1 data and Russian Phone Provider 1 data was not technically plausible, did not withstand technical scrutiny, contained gaps, conflicted with itself, and was user-created and not machine or tool-generated. And so this revelation, well, it obviously leads to many questions, such as who was the user that created this data? Was it Rodney Joffe, the tech executive? And who else might have been involved in its general creation? And in regards to the last question, well, consider for a moment what a previous court filing submitted by John Durham said in this regard, quote, in addition to their representation of the defendant, a separate lawyer at the firm is currently representing the 2016 Hillary for America presidential campaign, the Clinton campaign, as well as multiple former employees of that campaign in matters before the special counsel meaning that there are multiple lawyers being looked into. And then furthermore, within John Durham's latest filing, he stated that he provided immunity to a certain researcher in order to uncover some otherwise unavailable facts relating to the Alpha Bank project. Here's specifically what John Durham wrote, quote, the government therefore pursued Researcher 2's immunity, and for your reference, Researcher 2 has now been identified as Mr. David Dagan, in order to uncover otherwise unavailable facts underlying the opposition research project that Tech Executive 1, which is Rodney Joffe, and others carried out in advance of the the defendant's meeting with the FBI. And so the fact that Mr. David Dagan has been granted immunity is definitely worth noting, given the fact that John Durham also stated that the, in these documents that Rodney Joffe, the tech executive who started this whole Alpha Bank data in the first place, well, he remains a subject of the investigation. And so in plain English, what all this amounts to is that the lawyer who is representing the DNC, as well as the Clinton campaign, he took information from Mr. Rodney Joffe, the tech executive, and he gave it to both the FBI as well as the CIA in order for them to investigate President Trump. However, this information was then later found to be technically implausible as well as user generated. And so now Mr. John Durham is not only pursuing the lawyer who was acting as the middleman, but also he is actively pursuing the person or the people who were responsible for creating this phony data in the first place. And while the lawyers for Mr. Michael Sussman argued that it's impossible to prosecute Mr. Rodney Joffe because of a five-year statute of limitations, well, Mr. John Durham disagrees, saying this, quote, defense counsel is not and could not be aware of all the evidence that the government has collected and continues to collect or the possible violations of law it is investigating, meaning that the scope of this investigation appears to be getting bigger by the day. If you'd like to read more about this case, including all the documents that we discussed today, I'll throw all that into the description box below this video for you to check out. And also, I wanted to make mention that Mr. Sussman's trial is going to be starting on May 16th in federal court over in Washington, D.C. And I've been thinking about going there in person to sit in the courtroom in the audience and report on it live from Washington, D.C. as the whole thing plays itself out. Now, I'm a little bit on the fence since it would require a lot of traveling and a lot of work. However, I'm interested if you would be interested in such a thing. Please let me know in the comments section below whether I should go to Washington, D.C. and cover this John Durham case in person. And while you're making your way down there to leave a comment, take a small detour to smash, smash, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. And now let's... What's this? It's me. Of course it's secure because we use the Secure app, which is the sponsor of today's episode, as well as an awesome email and message service provider that actually cares about your privacy. Now listen, it's no big secret that our data is being mined and remined all the time. In fact, there was a recent study that was published in the year 2020, which found that 155 million Americans, likely including you and me, have suffered some form of data breach. And frankly, that's only what's publicly known. However, all those past problems with 
privacy issues and data mining, well, that can be an issue of the past because moving forward, you can use the Secure app, which both your messages, your emails, and your phone calls can remain private. That's because they have their servers and their data centers located in Switzerland instead of in the US or China or Russia. And why does that matter? Because Switzerland has the strictest data privacy laws in the entire world, and they are not subject to the intrusive Cloud app. Now, what I love the most about the Secure app is that they don't collect my data, they don't mine my data, they don't mine the data and phone numbers of my friends and family. Everything is private. And best of all, at least in my opinion, this does not work with your big tech email provider just because it is not secure. And so, and so check it out. You can head on over to secure.com and if you use promo code Roman, you can get 25% off. And frankly, their rates are not even that expensive. It only starts with $5 for the messenger and $10 for the email and messenger combo. And best of all, they offer a seven day free trial. And now, since you've completed this episode of Facts Matter, I would highly recommend that you head on over to Epic TV and check out an awesome episode of American Thought Leaders where Jan sat down and spoke with Dr. Aaron Kiriat on the rise of the biomedical security state here in America. Here's a trailer for that episode. This welding of public health with digital technologies of surveillance and control and the police powers of the state allow for intrusions on our privacy, on our bodily autonomy that are unprecedented in history. Today I sit down with psychiatrist and medical ethicist Dr. Aaron Cariotti, Chief of Medical Ethics at the Unity Project and Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. He previously was a professor at UC Irvine and director of UCI Health's medical ethics program before he was fired for refusing vaccination. This biomedical security state apparatus that has been put in place will remain in place and will be redeployed for other purposes. We discuss egregious violations of medical ethics he's seen over the course of this pandemic and the deadly consequences of these policies. Among working age Americans, there's been an unprecedented 40% rise in all-cause mortality, most of which is not due to COVID-19. And something is going on that is producing catastrophically bad outcomes. If you'd like to check out that full episode, as well as a plethora of other phenomenal content over on Epic TV, I'll throw a link to it. It'll be right there at the very top of the description box. Hope you click on it. Hope you check it out. I hope you subscribe. And I hope that you join us on this journey of exploring this beautiful, beautiful world through honest journalism that is based in truth and tradition. And then until next time, I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Stay informed and stay free.